Thanks very much, Lance. Uh, really appreciate it. And let me just take an opportunity to uh, thank Jamie and Jim for, for joining us. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of handoff as, over the course of the presentation uh, and let the experts talk about the things that they're most familiar with. So in today's webinar, uh, because it's Halloween, we're going to talk about scary things, fear and uncertainty. What are the perils of delivering unified communications? And I think you're going to find that a lot of what we talk about will be familiar to you if you've been out in the field doing this. We'll talk a bit about deployment models, what works, what doesn't, and why. And then introduce network edge orchestration, the ribbon solution for service assurance and security for unified communications. Uh, Jim's going to talk to us a little bit about our SD-WAN product and how that might fit into your UCAS deployments. And then finally, we'll talk about Cloud to Edge Complete, which is an as-a-service model for network edge orchestration. So I'm going to turn it over to Jamie at this point to talk a little bit about what's so hard about delivering unified communications. Jamie, take it away, please. Thank you, John. So I started searching for some pictures on the internet to help illustrate what could possibly go wrong when deploying UC services. I found several that were funny, some that were crude, and a few that were just inappropriate. Um, but I really like this one because I think it illustrates the situation perfectly. Like the guy over there selling knives, we can do everything possible to ensure a successful UC deployment. Um, but due to a combination of factors, including bad luck, sometimes the actions of others, uh, we can still have problems. In all seriousness, there are many factors that can disrupt uh, a successful UC deployment. We can have issues with the transport network, internet links going down, unfriendly routing devices, um, or simply a wide variety of SIP endpoints. They can all contribute to the problems that we have. Um, eavesdropping, attacks, and fraud in the network can happen at any time. And this all leads to customer experience issues. So service providers have some very real challenges when it comes to hosted UC. Often UC deployments sit behind routers and firewalls with differing rules or configurations. Um, this makes troubleshooting slow and sometimes root causes can't be found to problems. Limited interoperability between the various SIP endpoints can also slow deployments and cause ongoing issues. Uh, sometimes they don't manifest until weeks or months after the initial turnup. And often, service providers have no visibility to the devices behind their customer's firewall. When the customer has an issue, it's difficult to troubleshoot and nearly impossible to tell if the problem is on the LAN side or the WAN side of the network. This lack of visibility contributes to additional truck rolls. Um, we all know that having to send a tech out with multiple times for an installation um, and, and troubleshooting can get very expensive and cause extended customer downtime. And all of these issues create high support costs, which lower profit margins and contribute to lower customer satisfaction. Finally, uh, network security vulnerabilities can increase fraud, cause outages, and increase operational costs. So in January, GatePoint Research published uh, an interesting survey. They asked service providers about their biggest challenges and how they affect uh, their business. Uh, lack of LAN visibility and remote troubleshooting made up about 50% of the responses, um, while too many truck rolls, you can see down there in the yellow, uh, made up another 16%. So almost uh, 65, 66% of the technical challenges uh, from operators uh, resulting from um, challenges in the network. Um, and these challenges can be directly linked to the long resolution times and the high operating costs that you see on the, uh, the pie chart there on the right, making up almost 62% um, of the responses there. In this environment of hybrid cloud and on-premise applications, um, as well as 
bring your own device policies where we all have our own Android and iPhone devices. Uh, we need a zero trust policy for security. We can no longer assume an application or even a network is safe. A lot of enterprises have developed a layered security posture. Um, however, we're, we're seeing the UC components are particularly uh, vulnerable because of several factors, including the size of the pipes. Um, and that's because these pipes are not just carrying voice calls, but also video calls. And often uh, the systems see a lot of data moving through uh, the, the network or the pipes, and they assume that that data is uh, totally normal. This creates an opportunity for threats uh, to use the communication system, not just to get in, but to get out with whatever they're stealing. We see threats all throughout the communication system um, from mobility devices, video, UC, collaboration, um, even voice over Wi-Fi and, and more. And these bad actors, we call them, are constantly looking for ways to cause havoc on the network, either for monetary gains to disrupt internal, external um, customer services, or just to do reconnaissance into the entire corporate network to figure out other ways to attack. Uh, the rapid growth of um, SIP-based communications has caught the attention of many of these bad actors. They're looking to design their attacks to bring down your communications uh, infrastructure through any means, such as uh, telephony denial service attack, uh, voice phishing, registration floods, malicious endpoints, fraud, uh, SIP service password attacks, and, and many more. Think of your unified communication system like your office that I'm, that I'm sitting here right now. Um, it has an external door, it has windows, it has air vents. Now, these bad actors go around examining all those vulnerabilities looking for any point of entry to the network. And these unified communication systems are an attractive point of vulnerability for those looking to attack your enterprise customers or even your own network. Once they get in, they can do a lot of damage using uh, the UC system. Um, CFCA estimated SIP hacking cost more than $11 billion in 2016. They also estimated toll fraud to be more than $29 billion in 2017. Uh, and finally, Secure Logics reported that TDOS attacks were up 50% year over year with five occurring every minute. Besides having the ability to steal services, hackers are paid to ensure that services and access to services are compromised. When the UC um, network is down, it's something that impacts people end to end across the uh, enterprise. So I will now hand it off to John and to Jim, who will show you how we can help you simplify and secure these UC deployments. Thanks so much, Jamie. And uh, I, I think I finally figured out what my Halloween costume is. I'm going as a, uh, uh, a boy packer. Uh, maybe you can help me come up with a, a costume. So we've, we've seen uh, a lot of companies try a lot of different approaches to, to solving these service assurance and security issues, uh, ranging from, you know, very simple, as in do nothing. Um, lots of companies deliver you see services over the top, meaning on somebody else's network. They don't touch the customer prem. They don't supply anything on the customer prem, except generally speaking, IP endpoints. And this is kind of a hope and pray strategy. Will it work? Yes, it can work. And we see lots of companies out there delivering these services and, and making money doing it. But generally speaking, if you're going to go over the top, you've got to be cognizant of, of a couple of issues you're going to have some early life customer churn. I think we all understand that it takes a while if you're going over the top for, for a service to kind of settle down and find out where the, the weak points are. Um, in those first 30 days or so, some customers are just going to raise their hands and say, no way. One of the very uh, well-known over the top companies in their annual report publishes churn statistics and they say they've got 2% churn. But there's a little asterisk by it. And if you follow that asterisk to the bottom of the page, it says, 
not including first day, first 30 day trial period. So they make up for that, the churn in those first 30 days by just do, spending a lot of money on customer acquisition and, you know, just building it into their business plan that they're going to lose 10, 15, sometimes even 20% of their customers up front. So it can work and it's really cheap. There's no service quality management. There's no capital up front and very limited operational costs, except for the calls that are coming into the contact center uh, to say, hey, I've got a problem with the customer saying, I've got a problem with my service. With no visibility, it's very difficult to resolve. Oftentimes, there's a lot of finger pointing. The second method that we've seen for solving this problem, we call rip and replace. And this is kind of the other extreme, if you will. There are service providers out there who say, look, we've got to maintain end-to-end -end service quality, so we're just going to supply everything, meaning they're going to either build a secondary LAN specifically for voice traffic, not a VLAN, but a separate physical LAN uh, to carry voice traffic so that they can manage it end-to-end. And you potentially some, some other equipment as well. If you own the LAN and you own the WAN, well, you should be able to guarantee end-to-end -end service quality. And in, in this rip and replace model, that works every time. The problem is the capital costs can be high. You've got to put LAN switches out there or multifunction devices, routers, Wi-Fi access points, what have you. Um, and the operational costs are generally pretty high. Even if you're going to, let's say, a 20 seat insulation and rebuilding a LAN, that takes a technician with uh, a, a relatively skilled technician with, with uh, the ability to actually turn up a router, provision switches, get all the, uh, the VLANs correct. And that can take, you know, three, four, five hours to, to get done. Um, expensive for the person, lots of time, spending time out there, and then you're paying for all of the equipment. So the way people justify this is to say, look, we're going to put all of that cost up front, and we're probably not going to turn a profit on our service for nine months, 10 months, whatever it happens to be, and then we'll be profitable after that and can manage everything. So if you're comfortable with the high OPEX costs and the high CAPEX costs, this is certainly a model that will work. Network edge orchestration is the third way, if you will. Um, Network orchestration, and Jim's going to go into this in more detail in a second, consists of the Ribbon Edgeview Service Control Center, which lives in the cloud, and that can be any cloud, your cloud, private cloud, public cloud, uh, a hosted cloud, whatever you choose, that's there to um, manage devices on the edge called Edgemark Intelligent Edges. We believe that this is truly a, a, a cost-optimized approach. It provides a high level of service quality management, service assurance, and security. Upfront capital costs are low, and your ongoing operational costs are low as well. So Jim, I'd like to turn it over to you now to go through what that means to describe network edge orchestration in detail and to talk about the benefits for the service provider and for the end customer. Thanks, John. So, you know, as John mentioned, there's there's two components of the application, but I just a little bit of history on the creation of or how we came about this. The application was created about 16 years ago with the idea that we needed to create a high quality of experience for end users focused on voice. And exactly for some of the reasons that John and Jamie are talking about, um, essentially what this device is, is a uh, an enterprise session board or controller giving you the, that same uh, that same security and control that you have in the core network from a ribbon SBC at the edge at your customer site. And as that, as that application has been deployed and, you know, successfully been you know, achieving the goals that we've set for it, uh, we started to advance the application and now we have created what we call, uh, as John said, network edge orchestration, which there's two components. There's the edge view service control center, which is the network management software and then the Edgemark Intelligent Edge. So Edgeview is basically a cloud-based platform that runs in your data center, a partner data center, or even perhaps our data center. Uh, but it allows you to 
involve and interact with the customer across the entire uh, the customer experience across in the entire life cycle of the customer. Uh, it's involved in provisioning, configuration, monitoring, and trouble resolution. Uh, and the key thing there is that it's not just a device that tells you when something is wrong or an application tells you something's wrong. It actually helps you resolve those issues. Uh, from a provisioning perspective, it's incredibly powerful because, as you all know, SIP is a standard that many people deploy in various ways. So it's a, it's a in many ways, a non-standard standard. So your goal as a provider is to create a golden configuration or an environment that's repeatable. So Edu gives you the power to do that by giving you the tools to create a template or a, um, a configuration that is deployed across your network and the same every time. So your technicians don't have the ability to make any kind of uh, configuration errors. Uh, if you want to make global configuration changes, you can do that. Uh, so it gives you a tremendous amount of power from the network operation center to the edge of the network. Once those devices are configured and provisioned, the monitoring kicks in, and that's incredibly powerful uh, from the perspective of giving you the ability to see everything that's going off the customer site. Every 10 seconds, we're going to generate a, a set of analytics, including MOS scores, on the LAN side and the WAN side. So, you know, in this market, is you know, I know there's a lot of people who've been in telecom for quite a long time. We used to talk about the last mile. Now it's the last 50 feet. It's the distance from the the call the telephone closet to the IP phone on the desk. If that goes wrong, that's still going to be viewed as a challenge that you as a service provider needs to address. So we give you the ability to determine whether it's on the customer site or in your network or a third party over the top network and then give you the tools and analytics to solve those problems, uh, which is critical. Uh, and that real-time visibility allows you to solve problems now and not tomorrow or the next day when you might be able to get an engineer or technician out on site, which, you know, when John talks about uh, churn and customer side issues, that's critically important. You know, telecom is a business where there will be challenges, there will be issues. The key is you as a company, how well can you address those issues and resolve those issues in a way that maintains your customer's confidence in you? So, uh, and then finally, you know, Edgeview gives you the ability for the reporting and analytics of all the sites across, let's say, I'll pick a number, 30 days. So you can look at trends. How's the service performing? How are different access types performing? Uh, how are different configurations performing? You get to look at all those types of things by different analytics reports. Uh, and of course, Edgeview doesn't operate without the power of the Edgemark Intelligent Edge at the site. Uh, and this is a multifaceted device. Uh, it's a VoIP router. I'm sorry, it's a VoIP, a VoIP firewall. It's a router and it provides analytics. So essentially it gives you the ability to, to put a probe on the customer network, uh, constantly monitoring what's going on. Uh, from a security perspective, as I mentioned, being that it is a, a firewall, uh, it protects you from having to open up all the, the ports for SIP traffic. You lock down the ports, pinholes are opened up only when calls are made, only trusted hosts can, be, can address the edge mark. So you can't have denial of service attacks if you're using the trusted, hope case, the trusted host capabilities. And from a, uh, a station set on the customer side, from the IP phone side, um, we can access and interact with those devices from the NOC as well. So being the fact that this device is a secure device, trusted device on the customer's network, you have the ability to uh, basically access local devices like a polycom phone which could be reset, reprogrammed, reconfigured from the NOC. Again, getting back to the issue of cost of operation, anytime you can resolve a customer's problem today and without a truck roll is a savings in cost, an improvement in customer SAT, and a, uh, an overall more efficient way to operate your, your business. Uh, by the same token, if you do see security issues at the customer site, you can resolve those remotely, and if not remotely, when you do send somebody out on site, you know why you're sending them. Uh, these devices basically are physical devices or virtual devices. So if you own the last mile and it's, secure, it's a secure network that's part of your business, uh, you could deploy in a data center or you could deploy in a uh, white label environment on the customer site. Or as you can see on the, on the slide there, we have our 2900 
series, which is basically a very small, compact, efficient device that goes on the customer site. Uh, I mentioned the, the multifunction capability, but I'll get into that a little bit more later in the next slides. Uh, and the key thing is this device is not just multifunction, but it's multi-application. It's SD-WAN capable, it's analytics capable, it gives you the ability to add new applications and turn them up as needed at the customer site uh, as we turn them up within EdgeView. And it's all controlled through that partnership of EdgeView. Uh, and then finally, we do have some power over Ethernet devices. So if you're deploying small sites, say 8 to 12 seats or even smaller than that, uh, you can deploy this device as your firewall, your router, your Ethernet switch to plug those devices in which makes a, from an equipment consolidation and management perspective, very, very simple. John, why don't you flip to the next slide. So there's really four pillars that we address with the Network Edge orchestration application. Uh, service assurance is a key application. As I mentioned, the concept was created out of the idea of quality of service or quality of customer experience. And that just doesn't include the quality of the audio, but that means that if you have issues around uh, access, for example, if you want to give a customer uh, redundant access into a site, uh, it gives you the ability to give them uh, you know, higher service quality through load balancing and resiliency between those multiple LAN links. It can be achieved in a, in a binary mode where if link A goes down, then all traffic goes to link B, or in a more sophisticated environment, whereas if link A is not performing up to its you know, prime capacity, uh, and Link B is performing better for real-time applications, we can live and on the fly move applications that are real-time or critical in your business or in your customer's business over to Link B. So it always maintains a higher customer experience. And those links can be, you know, your broadband services. It can be an LTE backup service. Uh, if need be, it could be a, a third-party service if you truly need redundancy or resiliency. But the key is, if you're an access provider and you're providing a third-party access, you can control that through an application as opposed to having your customer go get that, that access and uh, deploying it without you. So it puts you in the driver's seat when it comes to the application. Uh, from a security perspective, it's, we've talked about you know, the, the idea that it, it's inherently a security device. Uh, which is effective in things like toll fraud, denial of service attacks, and other threats from SIP-based attacks. And, you know, I think the key thing here is with SIP-based attacks, uh, there's always a new and improved way to go after your, your network through new protocol attacks. And, uh, you know, we constantly monitor the, uh, as I said, the analytics and the statistics around the device, in addition to being very vigilant in how we update the software to make sure the software is up, is is uh, focused on any kind of security updates. From all that we've discussed so far, I think it's, you know, it's probably starting to become clear there's a huge OPEX savings here. You know, John used the example of uh, the customers who do nothing. They just basically they deploy broadband services, they have some kind of voice services to the site, and then they deploy IP phones at the site. Whereas there is a cost to deploying an edge mark and network edge orchestration based on the fact that you can run things efficiently, you can improve customer satisfaction, you can greatly reduce customer churn, you're really looking at an environment where the ROI of all the operational cost savings that the customer does not see basically proves out the cost of the system and covers the cost of the system. So yes, there's a cost, but the savings definitely outweigh the cost from a, uh, a basically a revenue protection perspective and a, and a uh, cost reduction perspective. But finally, if you can prove out the operational cost of the application, the beauty is you can also create new re revenue streams. Uh, if you look at, for example, monetizing the fact that we have service assurance application, typical deployment, let's say, is a $35 a seat deployment. But if you're going to offer the customer a resilient uh, bulletproof network, that commands a premium. That's a new, a new revenue stream. If you do that by providing them a second access port from your network or a, an LTE option, that's a new revenue stream. If you're doing that using our SD-WAN capabilities, that's a new revenue stream. So it enables you to offer 
really business solving applications, right? Because the goal is not, yes, the goal is to generate revenue, but ultimately the goal is to solve your customer's business problems and become a solid partner for that customer. And the beauty is we can give you all those capabilities. They're very simple to turn up because these are all inherent within the application themselves. But it's a, uh, it, it's a solid way to generate new revenue and really get a great relationship going with your customer base. And as I said, solve their customer, uh, their business issues, which ultimately that's your goal. John, why don't you flip to the next one? So as I mentioned, the Edgemark is a multifaceted device. As you can see in this slide, uh, there's seven different applications that run inherently on the Edgemark. It's a WAN router, uh, a SIP firewall, uh, and you know, in case the question comes up, I'll kind of, you know, take a proactive uh, answer. We do interact very well with data firewalls as well. If you have a customer, let's say a medical center that has a, uh, a data, firewall settle, data firewall set up that's already um, compliant and they don't want to touch the data firewall, we simply deploy in a proxy ARP environment. We sit in front of that data firewall. We hand all the data to that data firewall, so all the rules and, and uh, protections that are put in place by that existing data firewall are kept whole. We merely handle the voice. The reason why that's important is to the upper right-hand corner, when you're doing traffic shaping, which this device does, you want to make sure that you have access to all traffic coming into the building so that you can limit the amount of data being put through the system so that you can allocate the right amount of uh, voice bandwidth again, for that voice customer experience. Um, in addition, it's a NAT DHCP server. It's a full back-to-back -back user agent, uh, which is, again, provides some very important network, network resiliency components. For example, you can have your IP phones register to the Edgemark, and then the Edgemark can register to the core SPC, which means that if for whatever reason you have a, a, an outage or a large network outage, when the devices come back up, they're not storming your, your core SBC with registration messages. It's all done at the edge, and then the edge paces itself back to the core. Uh, we've had some large uh, Tier 1 carriers who've had some regional outage issues, and when they had it set up this way, it was a very graceful return to service. Uh, and then finally, the voice quality monitor, which is key, uh, because we're, as I mentioned, we're looking at about 120 statistics per call every 10 seconds. Uh, and the PSTN gateway, which, you know, we're, we're talking about voice over IP, but as we all know in telecom, old services never die. Uh, there's still a need for POTS lines out there. There's still a need for PRI out there. In the next slide I'll show you, we'll give an example of how we provide those services. But if your customer is not ready for all, an all IP environment and they're still looking to have POTS for door buzzers, overhead paging systems, fax lines, or PRIs for existing PBXs, all those can be addressed by an Edgemark with those telecom interfaces while providing SIP trunks out to the site, uh, in addition to just providing Ethernet access for a pure hosted voice solution. Uh, John, why don't you flip to the next slide? So I won't go through this eye chart in depth, but just to show you, uh, we have our IP board, session board, enterprise session border controllers, which we call the 2900 or the 7301. Uh, and the capacity that these, these devices scale from as low as five concurrent calls to as high as 300 concurrent calls on the 2900 family and as high as 2000 concurrent calls on the 7300 series or the, uh, the virtual device. Uh, and the same thing for our Edgemark multi-service gateways, which include analog and PRI, they go up to 500 concurrent calls. So from a scale perspective, we can handle very small offices and you know, with the 2,000 call limit, that's, as you can imagine, that's quite a number of, of active seats. Uh, all these devices have two WAN ports, which can be Ethernet or optical. Uh, they're all full gigabit throughput, which is key, because as you're looking at uh, access speeds increasing uh, in this world, you don't want to provide a service that is important to your network but throttles the speed that your customer is looking for. If you're currently providing a 500 gig connection to your customer, you want to make sure that they're getting that full 500 gig. Uh, all these devices are SD-WAN capable, and as you can see on the bottom, some have PRI, FXS, and FXO capabilities. Uh, so, you know, we've, we're looking to the future from a next generation of voice services, but we're not, we're still embracing the fact that telecom has a rich history 
of, of interfaces that are still needed and we're not looking for people to do a complete rip and replace of everything in their building. You, you want to be able to provide the services that they need in the terms they're looking for. John, why don't you flip to the next one. So a little more on the Edgeview Service Control Center. As I mentioned, you know, it's important from a provisioning and management perspective but from a monitoring and alerting perspective, it's, it's really amazing what you can do from the NOC. Uh, as I said, we have real-time visibility, and we have something called event-based triggers, which is it gives you the ability to set a threshold, say on a MOS score or a packet loss, and when that threshold is breached, it allows you to take, uh, uh, to start to initiate a, a series of events that will do a packet capture at the customer site, uh, perhaps, you know, capture the syslog and the MAN-D log so that when the engineer goes to, to look at the issue because from the alert, they've already had data collection done for them. And, and again, it allows you to streamline your process that says, hey, when we have an issue, this is what we want the engineering team to do for every, every trouble that they run into. And it also saves them from kind of the repetitive work of data collection. Uh, but again, this is very critical because you can set these, these triggers at different levels based on the fact that, you know, if you're having issues around a new customer, you want to set those triggers tighter to make sure their experience is solid. Um, and you can basically alter those triggers based on what's important to your network or what's important to your customer experience. Uh, but again, it's not just a monitoring device. We can troubleshoot and remediate those issues. Uh, you can look at the data and determine if it's a LAN access or a WAN, uh, sorry, a WAN access issue or a LAN issue. If it's a WAN issue and it's your access, you can hand that data over to your access team and say, hey, here's all the issues we're running into, here are the, the details around it, please get this resolved. If it's a third party access and you're in the over the top space in, out of your territory, that's incredibly important because you know, the third party access company may tell you, well, everything tests well to the DMARC and you can now show them data as to exactly why it's not testing well. But the key is you can get that remediation done if it's something with the customer site, you get visibility into the customer site, into the devices on the site. And in a recent release of Edgeview, uh, we've actually given you the ability for Edgeview to see what that site looks like. We, we call it a um, uh, system environment report. And then what that report does is when you deploy and the system and the site is up and running, you do a report, you look at, it'll tell you how many devices are on the LAN, what types of devices they are, access speeds, it, it basically does a pedigree of what the site looks like. So in three months, the customer calls you up and says, hey, I'm having problems here, not sure why, and we haven't done anything. You can compare the current system environment to the one you did when everything was up and running, and you might determine, well, there's four more LAN devices, I see you've got a new DHCP server out there, or your, your speed is reduced. So you can basically, when, you know, determine that Yes, there definitely are factors and voice over IP has issues, but there's also a lot of mitigating factors or a lot of external factors that can affect the way that, um, that networks perform. This gives you a much greater picture because, again, on that customer site, you never know what somebody might be doing at that local area, within their local area network, and you want to be able to know if there's changes. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned in, in the previous slide, reporting and analytics, looking at trends over 30 days, uh, KPIs, analytics, if you have an important customer that you want to do a quarterly customer review with, you can generate reports and show them the performance of the network. And, you know, it's always good. Customers may have perception of service. It's always good to have proof of quality. So when things are running well and you want to show them, it's good to have data to show them that. Uh, John, why don't you flip to the next one? So when we looked at SD-WAN, you know, where our device is deployed, we had a lot of customers over the past few years ask us what was our SD-WAN strategy. And, you know, it's a crowded market. There's a lot of, a lot of very good companies performing SD-WAN solutions, producing SD-WAN solutions in the market. Uh, but we looked at it from the perspective of they're all targeted towards large-scale enterprise networks with MPLS replacement. And, again, we're really focused on helping you solve your customers' business problems. And the market today is getting away from the idea of uh, large-scale MPLS networks and everything being, being hubbed at a corporate site. And it's more focused on, especially in the small business and small enterprise market, access to applications like Salesforce.com, access to Office 365, 
and, and network-based, cloud-based uh, applications. So we approach it from the perspective of what can we do as a software provider to give you an application that allows your customers to better manage that experience. And basically what we came through with the idea of we've already been prioritizing voice for over a decade. So in a sense, we've had SD-WAN for voice for a long time. Merely, we, we tweaked our software to, inc to include new queues, new priority queues, that allows a customer or the carrier to define priority queues based on key applications. So your customer might have key IoT applications, they may have uh, security-based applications, they may have um, you know, a, uh, a point-of-sale application that they want to prioritize over voice because it's the credit card where they make the money. So we've given the ability at the edge no requirement to deploy any kind of core equipment, which gets expensive and, and cumbersome in your network. But we focused on giving the edge mark the ability to prioritize those applications on the fly, meaning you know, it's going to look at the network, it's going to determine what's the best path for whatever that application is, whether it's voice, collaboration, video, or simply, as I said, uh, IoT or point of sale applications. Uh, Again, focus on service quality, but now we've expanded from just voice to mission critical applications for the end user. Uh, this is huge from a resiliency, oh, oh just one sec, um, back one slide. It's huge from a resiliency and business continuity perspective because when you consider the fact that if you're the local IT manager and the voice call drops, the first thing you're gonna get is a call from the end user saying, hey, things aren't working, whether you're at the site or you're at a remote site, you're gonna get that call. Uh, so what can we do to, to improve the service so that the IT organization knows exactly what's going on at the customer site and they're aware of any issues, but they minimize customer exposure. So flip to the next one now, John. Uh, so we have something uh, which we call stateful SIP transfer, which allows you to take an active call on link A, and when you see degradation in link A or a potential failure in link A, uh, then you can transfer that call over to link B without dropping the call. Customer, the end user on the phone is unaware that there was a failure, that business manager, office manager, IT manager will, will be aware that they had an internet link failure, but the customer won't be. So business operations will still may be maintained while your key customer, the person who's actually determined to buying your service and made those decisions, is protected from that you know, bad PR of a network failure but can then get to the issue of resolving the, the problem while their business is maintained and they're still up and running. Uh, the business policy control we've, we've covered from the perspective of, you know, it's we're, we're allowing them to create applications. And this is an interesting spin because this, is, this gives your customers the ability to create a, uh, a prioritization of certain applications. But by the same token, if you offer a suite of collaboration applications, you could use this application to prioritize those applications at the customer site. So they may not know they're using an SD-WAN application, but they just know that when they use your collaboration services, they work, you know, they're bulletproof, they're solid. Um, finally, survivability, which is a key feature. If you're, you're moving somebody from a PBX service to a hosted PBX service, the concern is going to be, well, it's in the cloud, I'm remote, what if there's a failure? So we have the ability from a survive with, with what we call our local survivability. If there's a full network failure, now as we've talked about, you can have one link failure and the other link will back that up. Uh, with survivability, you can have a traditional telco line back it up. It could be a traditional PRI or a traditional POTS line can be a backup. Uh, or simply, if you lose all connectivity, the edge mark has been monitoring the call paths the edge mark will allow that, that site to maintain desk-to-desk -desk dialing because there's basically a, um, a basic PBX capability built into the edge mark. So if you lost all outside connections through a fiber cut or some other connectivity issue, you can still have you know, the sales department dial the accounts payable department in the office. So they maintain desk-to-desk -desk dialing, which again is a critical selling features if you're looking to displace PBXs for hosted PBX as service to be able to give them the same experience. So, and I'll cover this fairly quickly because you know, I've kind of covered it at a high level, but essentially how our stateful SIP transfer works is 
it gives you the it, it monitors both links for performance and when it sees one link performing better than another you can route that mission critical traffic or the traffic that that end user has prioritized such as a voice call to the better performing link you can also restrict and then as you can see from the slide it happens in one to three seconds so it's it's virtually you know unnoticed by the end user because the call is still working uh, and when the service is performing better and the link that it was on it'll move back but you can also restrict this this movement to only key applications so that if you're using LTE as a backup you're not going to have somebody who's running Pandora out of, out of the customer office suddenly flip over to Pandora uh, flip over to an LTE link and now they're using a very expensive uh, LTE link for you know a not a mission critical application Why don't we flip to the next one, John? Uh, from the business policy routing or the application prioritization perspective, we, we have a lot of control over this. It can be based on URL. It can be based on source or destination IP address. Uh, that's key, obviously, because you can not only can you prioritize, but you can deprioritize. So as I mentioned before Pandora, you can deprioritize streaming audio or streaming video like Netflix. You could you know, obviously you can block that, but if, if you do, if the end user wants customers to have some ability to do that, you can just make sure it doesn't interfere with the rest of the business. IP prioritization might give streaming priority to the CEO's office. It might give streaming priority to uh, a key conference room in the building, or if you're in the healthcare environment, IP prioritization might give just data priority to the emergency room in a hospital, but min but reduce priority for the business office of the hospital. So you can get very creative with that, and you know you can also get to the point of port. So, for example, you could prioritize the conference room IP address for uh, a specific port or an application tied to that port, but everything else coming from that is the same priority as everywhere else. So, email from somebody plugged into the conference room doesn't get priority, but a live vi uh, video call will. Uh, as we talked about, it, this is how we enable the failover by giving you the ability to prioritize what is most important by what uh, cues. And you know, again, not to to overstress this, prioritization is two things: it's making something mission critical to your business, or making something out, you know, pushing something out of the way and making a best effort, which again is is important. Whereas you will have customers who have a culture of letting people watch Netflix while they're eating lunch, listen to music in their cube, whatever the fact, but prohibiting that, that behavior from affecting business traffic. If we go to the next slide, John. So the survivability piece, um, you know, just real quickly, this gives you a visibility or visual of how this works, but it gives you the ability to offer alternate routes during a failure. Uh, another example of this might be we talked about giving a POTS line as a backup to traditional SIP trunks uh, or a PRI as a backup to a SIP trunk. You could also, in a campus environment, if you have a, a large customer, let's say the university in your space, you can, give, you can put an edge mark in two different parts of the campus, have alternate access, uh, diverse access to those edge marks, so that if there's a fiber cut on one side, you can reroute all building traffic to the secondary site on the other side of campus. Hospital campus, medical facilities, any of those types of things. So not only does it give you the ability to preserve desk-to-desk -desk dialing, to give you alternate routes for traditional telco, but it gives you the ability to reroute traffic within a building or a campus to another device on that same local area network for alternate routes or diverse service entrance. Uh, and that, that's, in general, that's the, the application and the, the power that this device brings to the table. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to John where he can explain to you the uh, kind of the creative way we've really put this in front of service providers from a, a business model perspective. So there are a couple of different ways that you can work um, with Ribbon to purchase and use network edge orchestration. There's a very traditional model where you buy the edge mark as a piece of hardware, license it uh, for some number of concurrent calls, buy EdgeView, uh, set it up in your uh, data center, and uh, buy perpetual license software for it based on the number of edge marks under management. Uh, but recently, we've um, 
and actually I just noticed you might put the wrong slide in here. How about that? Um, uh, so this is the traditional model that you're looking at. Uh, our cloud to edge model is, is really unique. Um, we've actually cut the prices on the Edgemark Intelligent Edges and removed licensing restrictions on them um, so that you can take an Edgemark 2900, which is capable of doing up to 300 concurrent calls, and put it in a very small office with 15 employees or uh, a headquarters of a regional company with a, a thousand employees. The device will cost the same and it's in the hundreds of, of, of dollars. Uh, in the cloud to edge model there is a monthly service fee uh, per site. So a charge per site per month. For that charge you get all of the call licenses you would ever need. You get full access to edge view with uh, an unlimited number of edge marks uh, capable of being under management and it includes all of your support and maintenance for both edge mark and edge view this has become a, a really popular uh, business model with a, a, a decent amount of our customer base uh, because they're selling unified communication services on a per seat per month basis so typically what they will do is either call out a service assurance fee um, explicitly and use that as a differentiator against pure over-the-top services, so 25 bucks a month or what have you, $30 a month. We've even got partners who are charging um, a management fee of $100 a month that, that end customers are buying. Um, and just absorbing that per site per month charge and actually making money on it. Uh, other customers are bearing the um, the per site per month charge in their product costs, banking on the OPEX savings that Jim talked about, and the data points that we have suggest that the OPEX savings uh, for installation, service deployment, day two support and beyond can be as much as 35% over uh, what you're doing today. Uh, and the third model is they'll often just uh, make a slight adjustment to the per seat per month charge to either cover the cost or increase the cost of the um, uh, of the monthly service assurance fee. So I apologize for having the wrong slide in here, but essentially um, it's up to you. You can buy in the traditional CapEx heavy model, as you see displayed here, or in the OpEx model, which we call Cloud to Edge Complete. And then finally, let me just sort of wrap up um, the, the webinar and, and we'll take some questions from you. Um, by letting you know that, that with Ribbon, we now have a complete core to edge SBC portfolio. Uh, we are number one in market share uh, in enterprise session border control, and that's where the Edgemark Intelligent Edge gets counted. And number two in uh, the core SBC market that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, this end-to-end -end solution really provides unprecedented levels of service assurance, security, visibility, and analytics. The Intelligent Edge we've talked about uh, quite a bit, and, and I think uh, hopefully you can see the value in it. Single device to do uh, just about everything you would need uh, for, for UCAS and other services with Edge View in the cloud, provisioning, configuring, managing the end solution, Edge solutions, and the end-to-end -end security analytics uh, coming from Ribbon Protect in, in the core and the Edge View Service Control Center uh, managing the customer edge. Uh, our product and engineering teams are diligently working to uh, integrate those two analytic streams into a, a, a single view. Uh, more on that soon. So I want to thank everyone for, for joining us this morning. And Lance, uh, do you want to come back on and uh, let's see if there's some questions from the audience? Sure, sure. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, we have a couple questions to address. I think it would be good to, to answer so everyone could hear. Uh, the first one, um, are there any limitations on the amount of secondary bandwidth that the SD-WAN product uses? Jim, you want to take that? Yeah, so what's interesting about the way we've decided to deploy this application is it's you have access to the full gigabit uh, link in each uh, of each of the two WAN ports, whereas some of the other providers will sell it at a 10 meg license, 50 meg license, 100 meg license. We have a single site cost per month on the SD-WAN service and it's uh, irrelevant what speed you choose to use. So we, we don't want to make that a limiting factor for our customers to, it's, it's more to worry about if they have to quote unquote size the customer site. 
Right, and and Jim, just to uh, you know, kind of layer onto that, um, we we've seen what that looks like. We've uh, gotten some pitches from uh, SD WAN companies, uh, and and as you say, they will limit it. It's great. You've got two WAN links, and your second WAN link may be 50 meg, but um, they may only license it for 20 meg, which means only 20 meg of it can be used for SD WAN traffic. And you know, the prices that we've seen for it are are pretty high. Um, three, four, even as much as seven hundred dollars per site per month with a, a, a twenty meg license, and uh, you know I'm sure uh, Jim and the Ribbon Sales team would be happy to discuss pricing with you on uh, the Ribbon SD WAN solution, which is um, uh, I will say uh, significantly more suited to small and medium enterprise budgets. Okay, uh, thanks guys for that. Does someone else ask? Is this uh, application in production? So, yeah, it, 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 go ahead, Jim. Please. Well, I was going to say, yeah. So, it, you know, we've we've deployed over six hundred thousand network uh, edge marks, uh, and over the past fifteen, sixteen years, so it's it's very heavily uh, tested, battle tested, bulletproof. Uh, SD WAN is a new release for us this year, which is in production with some customers now. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, this is not in beta. This is fully deployed, fully released, and heavily used up and down the telecom spectrum by different types of service providers. And our, our largest customer has uh, close to 60,000 uh, edge marks under, manage, under management. They're using a geographically redundant HA edge view pair to, to manage all of that on a 7 by 24 basis. So uh, it, it's battle tested not only for you know, hundreds of deployments, but tens of thousands of deployments. Good deal. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know, uh, does the solution have any pre-canned configurations for certain PBX types to help with the uh, turn-up time? Sure, I can, I can take that. We've got a, uh, uh, a quick connect interoperability land, uh, uh, operability lab excuse me, in the um, Ribbon San Jose office where we've got about 50 or 60 different PBXs. Uh, that we're constantly doing interop with. So Edgemark with this version of code on it, uh, Avaya IP Office with that version of code on it. So if you're selling SIP trunks to customers who've got an existing IP PBX, uh, we have got configurations for the Edgemark as well as configuration guides for the PBX. Um, but to, to go beyond SIP trunking to, to a full UCAS deployment, uh, we do have standard configurations that uh, you can apply uh, for different deployment models. Um, you know, if you're deploying this uh, using what we call transparent proxy mode, we've got a configuration for that, which is the most popular deployment model for uh, hosted PBX and UCAS. Uh, and then finally, I'll tell you that um, if you sign up as a Cloud to Edge customer, we have a program called Jumpstart that works with you not simply to give you kind of a generic or uh, pretty complete configuration, but one of the goals of Jumpstart is to work with you to get a configuration that works for you and your environment and, and your customers uh, so that you can deploy very consistently. The uh, customer I mentioned that, that has about 60,000 edge marks under deployment uses only six different configurations across that customer base, so that's a pretty small number. We find that with um, a, a smaller service provider, you can probably do it with one configuration, sometimes two. And we also have zero touch provisioning, meaning uh, when a tech or your customer plugs in the edge mark, it communicates with the zero touch provisioning server that recognizes the device as being, belonging to a certain service provider, and it will uh, push that configuration out to the edge mark automatically. Um, the whole process takes, you know, a minute. Um, in fact, uh, phone configurations take a little bit longer. Typically in our testing in our interop lab, what we see is uh, Edgemark fresh out of the box with some phones behind it. Uh, in about three minutes, you're, um, you're making calls through those phones. So it's very quick with very little uh, intervention on site. Okay, uh, we probably have time for two more. I did want to mention also that some of the questions have been asked via the chat and, and the team has been answering. So if you want to see those questions and the answers, you can 
you can see that down in the question box. Um, another one came through, uh, John and Jim, about uh, what can the solution do if a customer has a low MOST score? Go for it, Jim. So, you know, as I mentioned, the uh, we have the ability to do the event trigger. So uh, if a if MOS score drops below a certain threshold, uh, you have the ability to immediately look at that site, determine is it the land side MOS score or the WAN side MOS score, and then actively troubleshoot from edge view. Uh, so you can determine if it's, you know, by looking at the different analytics around the links, is it uh, packet loss? Is it another type of interference? It it gives you that that uh, analytics and troubleshooting capability in addition to using um, uh, what's called a TWAMP, which is an analytics protocol to test between the edge mark and TWAMP compatible IP phones to determine if it's an issue around cabling or design at the local area network. So yes, once you determine as a problem, you can do a lot to troubleshoot that and you know, resolve as much as you can through configuration or, you know, as mentioned before, if you're going, if it, the end result is you need to roll a truck, it will be because you absolutely had to and not because you're sending somebody out there to see what's going on. The, the one thing I'll add to that, Jim, is we also have something called a packet capture ring buffer. So essentially the edge mark is storing uh, at this point the last 10 minutes of activity at a customer site. So one of the event triggers that Jim talked about um, that can be set up is to say, if you see a MOS score below 3.5 um, at any site, dump the packet capture ring buffer, start doing packet capture on the LAN interface and the WAN interface. So that when, if your customer calls in and says, hey, we're having uh, some voice quality issues, you not only have um, a, a, a packet capture on both the LAN and the WAN side uh, once the low MOS score was registered, but also the 10 minutes leading up to that low MOS score so you can watch what, what happened. Very powerful diagnostic tool. All right, guys, we probably have time for one more here before we wrap things up. Uh, question is, what about LTE? Uh, do you just use a LTE to WAN converter or how does all that work? Go ahead, Jim. So basically for LTE, we don't have an LTE device inherent or an antenna transceiver in the actual device. And the reason for that is typically you deploy an edge mark in an equipment room or an equipment closet at a customer site, which can result in a lot of EMI interference. So if you're going to use LTE as a backup, you want to have it, uh, the LTE antenna put someplace that's, um, uh, that's in near a window, near where you're going to get the strongest signal. And um, there's a few providers, companies like Accelerated Concepts that we work with that essentially receive the LTE signal and then pass it back to us through the, the Ethernet connections in the building. So it maximizes the speed and the connection while still giving us the ability to, uh, to do Ethernet uh, through the device. Okay. Very good. So uh, anything else, John or Jim, last minute uh, things or last comments before I wrap it all up and, and end the webinar today? Just thank you, uh, everyone, for, for joining us today and uh, look forward to continuing the, uh, the conversation with you.